I'm the director of growth management. I'm Paul Ingram at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Glad to have you here this morning. Um, uh, wish we could be with all of you in person, although we have some really great, we have a really great attendance um, for this webinar. And I think that's one of the things that webinars allow us to do is to be able to reach people. Um, in fact, I think we have some people from other parts of the world, um, uh, but also other parts of the state, not just in the Puget Sound region. So we're glad to have you all here this morning for our passport to 2044, that really trying to emphasize that having that vision and looking ahead to the future. Um, this webinar and this series of, of webinars um, and events is a partnership between the Puget Sound Regional Council, the State Department of Commerce, and the Municipal Research Service Center. Um, all three of us, all three of those agencies um, have a lot of support and assistance for comprehensive plan, plan, comprehensive plan updates, sorry for the tongue twister there. Um, and are glad to be able to help you through this process. Uh, today, we will focus primarily on the Puget Sound region. Um, under GMA, the Puget Sound region is the first in the comp plan update cycle. Um, but the information that Commerce has at the early part of the webinar certainly applies statewide. And some of the um, information that PSRC will provide is also perhaps valuable to any community in the state that's planning. Um, so we, we hope that that's very valuable to all of you. Um, in addition to this workshop, um, we will have a series of deep dive uh, events that will focus on specific topics. Um, this workshop will be really focused on things that are new and different from prior rounds. So if you have gone through the comprehensive plan update process previously, we'll try to touch on a number of things that um, our new commerce will highlight a number of the changes from House Bill 1220 regarding your housing element and other state law changes. PSRC will focus on Vision 2050 and what's new from that versus Vision 2040 and some of the plan review process steps. Um, this section, we want to let you know this session is being recorded. So if you want to come back to it, you can return to it, come to uh, the PSRC website, be able to watch it and share it with your staff or with other planners. And um, we will also have a Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions along the way, please submit them through that Q&A. Um, we'll ask presenters to go through their presentations, and then we'll have a chance to be able to answer some of those questions at the end of their uh, presentations. We may not be able to get to all the questions, but we'll record those questions. They'll be useful for a, a FAQ type document that we'll be preparing. And um, they will also help inform some of those deep dive sessions that may come up in the future. Um, so with that, um, I want to introduce our um, two presenters to kick things off. And the first is uh, Deputy Mayor Tracy Buxton. Uh, as Deputy Mayor of the City of Des Moines, uh, Tracy Buxton serves her family, her city, and the region with a supportive voice for public safety, a strong economy, and responsible transportation and housing. Serving on the city's transportation committee and chair of local public safety and the Soundside Alliance for Economic Development, she brings depth to regional leadership on the Growth Management Policy Board, Sound City's Executive Board, and South King Housing and Homelessness Partners Executive Board. Deputy Mayor Buxton is excited to be here today to share some thoughts of how a good planning process can benefit public officials in support of their communities. Uh, welcome, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is this is a great opportunity and thank all of you for carving out this time this morning to invest in our cities. So I'm glad to be here to help kick off the 2024 comprehensive plan updates. So first I wanted to take a couple minutes to just uh, make a note about why local comprehensive planning is so important. So many great things are happening in our local communities as we move through recovery into progress moving forward. New people are moving here from all over the nation and really all over the world. As we grow, our needs do too, and investments in housing and transportation for all and addressing climate change impacts. So comprehensive planning provides our communities 
with a great opportunity to look into the future and envision what our current and future community members want. So the major periodic update to local comprehensive plans is a once in a decade opportunity for local planning to engage communities, collaborate with partners and carry out a shared regional vision. And I think that word shared is pretty key as a region we worked together over the last couple of years to develop and adopt, and adopt Vision 2050, the region's long range plan for growth. Vision 2050 shows a commitment throughout the region and amazing, right? 86 local governments co collaborating on this for how we want to work together to plan for growth into the future. So working together is essential. I think we all recognize that just across the street from most uh, many of our municipalities, especially the ones uh, that uh, are centrally more urban, right across the street from one municipality is another municipality. Right across the street from one county is another county. So our policies affect each other very uh, closely. It's so important to work together. Like in my own jurisdiction in Des Moines, we, Pacific Highway runs through five, jur five jurisdictions and the Port of Seattle in the space of only a few miles. So whatever we do there is going to affect all of our neighbors. Vision 2050 <clears throat> set the stage for updated planning coordination countywide with tribal nations and other stakeholders and with local planning efforts. So this vision includes a new and additional focus on several issues uh, over the previous Vision 2040, which emphasized uh, housing affordability for all, climate change, racial equity, and planning for high capacity tr transit. So just a couple personal, more personal remarks, you know, about the workshop today. Personally, uh, PSRC and M MRSC I feel have quite a gift for administration, organization, and workability. As resources, I, my experience, they've been incredibly kind, informed, and reasonable. And that's why I'm really excited about this opportunity for all of us to connect today with some terrific resources that will help us help the region move forward. And uh, before handing off the mic, you know, I want to take a couple of moments also to encourage us and really all of you and say something maybe a little unexpected. Thank you. Thank you for choosing this career and taking the time to hone your craft, like coming to this workshop today. Thank you also for making us um, meaning policymakers. I'm one of the very few policymakers, uh, you know, elected at this workshop today. Um, you make us look smart. And what I mean by that as a general rule, institutional knowledge among municipal electeds can be pretty shallow. And that's not because we have double digit IQs, right? I mean, well, there are those few, right? <laughs> but no, really, it's because of the transient nature of this elected thing. In King County alone, there's been about a 50% turnover in elected official positions just in the last couple of elect election cycles. So what that does is, is you've got this constant new, new kids on the block, right? And so this, na this transient nature can create a hurdle when it comes to policymaking. And our well, even our well-informed strong mayors are not policymakers. So this inherent challenge this is an inherent challenge of working in and for municipal government, which is what we all do. So beyond your task of vision and planning, electeds also need your help in promoting this vision for safe, sustainable, livable communities for all of us. We need continual, understandable education as your electeds. We want to promote this work and help our communities to understand how we're making their needs and desires a reality through these, this collaboration, right? So I wanna thank you for your support and your efforts and your patience in answering our questions, which helps to create advocacy. And you, you're making a difference, right? I, I think I wanted to say this almost more poignant than everything else. 
sometimes the tedium of it, drawing lines, writing procedure with numbers, getting everything grammatically correct into sentences. You can feel sometimes that your voice maybe isn't making a meaningful difference in the world, but it is. And I'm so thankful for, for you and your communities. They don't realize how much work it has gone into creating these beautiful spaces. And you do that. And I'm thankful for you. We're all thankful for you. You are essential as a piece to a grand puzzle. So I want to thank you again. Thank you for taking time today to help our region move forward into amazing communities where we all love to live, work, and play. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Buxton. Those that was really wonderful to hear and really puts a point on uh, why it's important to do a good job with a uh, conference of planning and, and how beneficial it is. It's not just a project uh, where we have to kind of check off the boxes to meet GMA requirements, but uh, how it's valuable to both our elected officials. We want to make you look smart, um, but we also have this broader goal of making our communities wonderful places to live. Um, next, we have Chip Vincent. Chip is the uh, administrator for the Department of Community and Economic Development for the city of Renton. Um, Chip has been with the city for the last 14 years, and we asked Chip to speak. He has a lot of experience in conference of planning. Prior to coming to Renton, Chip worked for Pierce County, where he headed up planning efforts to implement growth management. Um, he has participated in numerous state, regional, countywide efforts to refine and implement GMA. He, um, in fact, he was the first chair of a PSRC staff group back many years ago uh, to develop the multi-county planning policies. Um, we did not invite him here to recount that history, um, but uh, that group has since transitioned to become the regional staff committee where Chip now serves as one of the co-chairs. So he's really in an excellent position to talk to us a little bit about uh, the trials and challenges and opportunities um, for the comp plan process and maybe uh, some of the pitfalls to watch out for. Uh, Chip? Great. Well, thank you all so much for the introduction. And thank you as well, uh, Deputy Mayor Buxton, for your comments. And it's greatly appreciated by all of us here today. Um, as Paul indicated, I've been asked to share with you my observations and lessons learned over the course of my 32 years implementing the Growth Management Act in 15 minutes. I'm going to try. My perspective is based on, <clears throat> excuse me, having worked at the city, county, and regional levels of government. Here are my observations. First is start early and work to meet your deadlines. Deadlines are your friend. Take them seriously. I realize this sounds counterintuitive, um, but you will never have enough information to make the right decision on everything. Perfection is the enemy of good. Comprehensive planning is an exercise in adaptive management. It is more important to put something in place and learn from it and be willing to adapt and adjust to what you learn over time than spending more time than you've been allocated trying to get it perfect. If you have not already experienced it, you will. And it is amazing how quickly 10 years goes by and you're starting all over and you're at it again. Next is public participation. Uh, this is one of the areas I have seen the most pronounced change since the adoption of the Growth Management Act in 1990. There was no internet as we know it today when the GMA passed back then. No social media, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, or my least favorite, next door. Um, while technology brings with it many challenges, it always also opens doors of opportunity that did not exist before. To do public participation correctly, you cannot rely on legal notices and expect people to come to you as we have expected it to be done in the past. Rather, you need to go to them. There are many groups that have been unintentionally left out of the conversation about creating a blueprint for the future. And this now more than ever needs to be addressed in this upcoming comprehensive plan update cycle. One of my favorite experiences uh, in Renton is when we were developing the Benson Hill Community Plan. We went to every neighborhood picnic in the Benson Hill over the course of a summer. We would ask people at random 
young, old, male, female, black, white, and everyone in between, if they would be willing to be interviewed on camera, we would ask them three simple questions. What do you like best about your neighborhood? What do you like least? And if you could change one thing, what would it be? These interviews form the backbone of our public participation plan and were a powerful tool when the video was played during the community plan adoption process. One of the, one of the areas of special attention in your public participation plan needs to be how to communicate and collaborate with affected tribal communities. As sovereign nations, they are not required to meet the requirements of the Growth Management Act that have a unique and legal standing that needs to be acknowledged and documented as part of your public participation plan. No matter how well you perform your public participation plan, there will always be that one person who comes to your council meeting the last evening before final adoption and says to your council, what is this comprehensive plan? How is it going to affect my property? And why wasn't I notified? Like gravity, this is just the way things are. To help inoculate yourself from this, uh, develop a public participation plan and corresponding schedule and have your council adopt it before you begin the update process. This will help share the responsibility for when that eventual person does show up at the last meeting. Next is I would like to make the recommendations to um, make your plans comprehensive. When done correctly, comprehensive plans are not the dominion of the planning department or the community and development departments, but rather the dominion of all operation departments within municipality, as well as the special purpose districts they are served in the municipality. This is its own challenge. It is important to consider how to address this. Enterprise funds, utility districts, special purpose districts, bring with them their own set of challenges because many of them believe their only obligation is to their existing ratepayer base or district. Whether it is through the development of interdepartmental teams, stakeholder committees, oversight boards, it is important to share the ownership and the creation of the update to the comprehensive plan. Make plans to ensure that the infrastructure and services are there when the growth comes and the need is there. I remember when at the urging of special purpose districts, mostly the ports, uh, Governor Gardner at the time vetoed the section of the Growth Management Act requiring special purpose districts to plan in accordance with the Growth Management Act. That was a huge mistake and has not been corrected. And we need to account and adjust for it today in developing the updates to our comprehensive plans. And then lastly, under plan comprehensively, and that is to really, if you're in uh, a situation that's different from Des Moines, as we just heard, and you have an area of unincorporation urban area around you, one of the goals of the Growth Management Act is to convert these existing unincorporated areas to incorporated through either annexation or incorporations. Cities should not wait for the vote to annex to begin planning for these areas within the county. Counties need to engage cities early to facilitate the transition of governance. This can be done several ways, but the most effective tool, I believe, is through an interlocal agreement between the municipalities. The degree to which this does not help happen only ensures that the annexation or incorporation is less likely to ever happen due to the ever increasing costs associated with incorporation either or annexation. Next is make your plan usable, easy to understand and administer. Satisfying all the requirements of the Growth Management Act and making your plan workable, nimble and easy to understand are at odds with each other. To the degree a plan is unnecessarily long and verbose only guarantees it will not be used or understood. Also, it is important to, it is important that the more verbiage be removed from the plan than is necessary. It is harder to write a plan that is short, concise, and succinct than it is to be verbose. Minimize the use of your words in the plan update and rely more heavily on pictures, graphics, 
and matrices to communicate information. You can communicate a lot more information this way. Additionally, consider putting all the supporting documentation from your comprehensive plan update into a technical appendix. This way you can use your comprehensive plan to be more easily understood while satisfying the requirements of the Growth Management Act. As an example, consider putting your capital facilities plan into an appendix that is cross-referenced in the capital facilities element of the comprehensive plan, which simply serves as an executive summary of that same capital facility plan. When I was working in Pierce County to develop our first comprehensive plan under the Growth Management Act, um, when we brought all of the elements of the plan together into a consolidated plan, it was over 700 pages. I was horrified. When we went back to the Department of Community Trade and Economic Development checklist and took everything out of the plan that was not required to be there, we cut the plan in half, roughly 350 pages in length. I knew we could do better. In Renton, for the required 2015 update to the comprehensive plan, we scrapped the almost 300 page comprehensive plan that the city had in place. And we established a goal of creating a comprehensive plan that was less than 100 pages. We did it in 99 using all the techniques I just described. The positive feedback we received was overwhelming. We submitted the plan with the encouragement of the Department of Commerce for Governor Smart Community Award. I was sure we were going to get it, only to be beat out by the city in Eastern Washington called Colfax, who wrote one of the most inspired plans I've ever read. Uh, they did the plan update simply because it was not required by the Growth Management Act for them to do it. They actually did it because it was the right thing to do. Hard to compete with that. Here's hoping Colfax does not submit another comp plan update this time around for all of our sakes. The next issue that I've identified that I'd like to speak to is that uh, density in design. When I first read the Growth Management Act in the spring of 1990, when I was eight, I walked away with a clear message that density was good within urban growth boundaries for all the associated benefits we now know. What I did not know or appreciate at the time was the importance of urban design. Density can easily become a four letter word if not designed well. It is imperative for the success of our comprehensive plans to consider to include an urban design element as a significant component. New development in our communities should add value, quality and characters. And this will not happen without clear focus on the importance of urban design. Next is to think and act regionally. Uh, I'm not saying this because I am giving a presentation to part of the PSRC program here today. As Deputy Mayor Buxton pointed out, the reality is in the Puget Sound, we live in an urban metropolis. Consider that there are 39 counties in Washington state and the four counties represented by PSRC, Kitsap, Snohomish, Pearson King, represent over half the state's population and less than 10% of the land area of the state. What this says is that we are not only urban, but we are inextricably connected to each other, as Deputy Mayor Buxton said. The issues we face in our municipalities cannot be solved in our municipalities alone. To the degree we are not collectively engaged in work going on at the countywide level or the regional level, we will fail the communities we serve. There's an old political axiom that states, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. I found this to be true. Most of the challenges we face with growth are regional challenges that can only be addressed at the regional level. It takes commitment from all of us to work together collectively and collaboratively at the regional council. I've always been impressed by our elected officials speaking at the PSRC and doing their work back home in their own communities. More times than not, they are willing to accept the challenges of, at the local level because they understand their role as part of the regional planning effort. Next is to link policies and implementation. In my estimation, this is the most important aspect of the comprehensive plan is how it's going to be implemented. 
And whether through zoning, development regulations, or sub-area plans, it is important in the development of a plan to think how it will be implemented over time. It is imperative that as you develop policy, you consider how much it's going to cost to implement, who will be responsible, the stakeholders who need to be involved in the implementation, and a timeline and schedule for implementation. Establishing a stakeholder committee to guide the implementation of the plan over time is a way to create accountability and ensure that the plan does not stagnate over time. And then finally, um, observe, listen, and learn. In the last 32 years of my career, since the passions of GMA, I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people. Um, there is something unique. Uh, that binds people together who work towards creating better future for our communities. Identify people who you can learn from and seek their counsel. You will be better planning professionals as a result. I've been lucky enough to work with some incredible people over the course of my career who've guided me along the way, many of whom I've met here at forums at the Puget Sound Regional Council like Eric Shields, Barb Mock, Rob Odell, Joe Tovar, Dennis Clark, Nancy Owsley, Alan Giffen, Jeff Burst, Chris Hugo, and Shane Hope, just to name a few. They are, these people are all retired now, but have left an indelible imprint on the communities they serve. I encourage all of you to take every opportunity to go to conferences, workshops, seminars like this, and find your people. In the end, I hope you will feel as fortunate as I do and the community you serve will be better for it. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Great words of wisdom from a lot of experience you've had in the past. Um, one, uh, I'll just comment on, on one of those points, which was about implementation. I, I'd say here at PSRC, we review all the 86 conference of plans that get developed and after the 2015 2016 cycle um, i would say like they're all great plans I, I i don't think there's any plan out there that was like a bad plan poorly written you know totally off track uh we had different comments on different individual items but they were all really great plans um you met you made a comment about implementation and i think that's while there are some gma changes people have to update policies there's new city direction implementation is going to be perhaps a really key thing uh, in this cycle. I mean, I, I expect communities are, are going to demand it and want it. Like, okay, you set this great vision out. What are you going to do? How are you going to get there? Exactly. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chip. Um, you, appreciate all that. Um, next, we have uh, uh, Department of Commerce is going to talk about uh, the fundamentals of GMA and what's new and different, including um, some of the big questions that many of you have had, many of us have, have had about how do we interpret House Bill 1220 and the requirements for um, housing elements, um, but also some of the other legislative changes that have happened in the last uh, few years or since the last update cycle um, and what that means for our comp plan updates. Um, Dave Anderson is going to talk about money that's available. So that's maybe one of the reasons many of you are turn, tuning in is um, for the first time in a long time, there's some, some really good um, funding sources available from the state, both for the comp plan update and for some other programs. So that's really important. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Suzanne Austin at the State Department of Commerce to talk about uh, GMA and the commerce role in supporting comp plan updates. Suzanne. Great, thank you, Paul. Let me get my screen up here. There we go. Everyone can see my screen here. Uh, thanks again, Paul. Um, thanks for everyone uh, who's attending. We're really glad to see such high attendance here to our first workshop of the season here and of the cycle. Um, I'm Suzanne Austin with Commerce's Growth Management Services. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you. And again, thanks for attending today. For the next half hour or so, we'll be giving an overview of the periodic update cycle, what's new, 
submitting your documents to Commerce, and then we'll dive a little deeper into the two most popular topics of this cycle. And as Paul mentioned, um, that's grant funding opportunities and housing needs. We'll then have about 15 minutes for Q&A with Commerce staff uh, before moving into PSRC's presentation. And feel free to post comments in the chat and we can address them at the end. So for those of you who have not been involved in a periodic update process at the local level, uh, this slide represents um, a basic overview of the steps that a local government will take. Um, it looks a little wordy, but uh, don't fear. Uh, you take one step at a time and work your way through. Um, and as many of you are gearing up to start the process, you know that some of these steps can take months, if not years. Um, so definitely great to be starting now. Um, if your jurisdictions, they're outside the 2024 um, cycle, uh, thanks for coming today. And um, it's a good time to start uh, gearing up and looking at these things early on. Uh, one thing that's not noted in this graphic is the step for jurisdictions who are within King, Kitsap, Pierce, and Snohomish counties to work with PSRC on review and certification of their comp plans prior to submitting to Commerce. And as a reminder, just wanted to let you know that, uh, remind you that Commerce is not a regulatory agency. We review your, your comp plans and development regulations for compliance with GMA statutes and provide technical assistance through our regional assistance team of planners who many of you have already worked with. And the purpose of this noticing requirement is to allow commerce and other state agencies the opportunity to participate during the public review process and may provide comments to you on the proposed changes as well. And new for this cycle are changes that were made in this last uh, 2021 to 22 legislative session. 2024 jurisdictions that you can see on the map here now have until December 31st of 2024 to complete and submit their updates. The following, following years will still have a deadline of June 30th. Um, so this map will be posted on our website as well as a, as a handy reminder. Um, also, the cycle will change from eight years to 10 years um, after this upcoming cycle. Um, so for those turning in their updates in 2024, your next periodic update won't be due until 2034. And again, for those of you, <clears throat> excuse me, attending through uh, the 2025 to 27 jurisdictions, um, Commerce will be holding these workshops every single year of the cycle. Um, so no need to try and remember all this now. Um, we'll be holding uh, deeper dive workshops as well as kickoff workshops for each year of the cycle. Um, but we do appreciate you attending early. So the new growth management legislation, uh, I know this slide may look like a, a wall of text, <laughs> um, but I wanted to make sure I provided a short summary of each new bill. Um, and we do hope that you'll download these presentations to have on hand throughout your process so that you can look at them as cheat sheets, uh, quick reference, quick access to links and our contact information along the way. And really, as you can see, there was a lot of really great work done in this last session. Um, to really invest in aiding growth management and addressing the problems that all of our communities are facing all across the state. And these new bills here, just to summarize, um, they do cover new housing requirements, UGA and Lambert expansions, changes to definitions, and tribal participation in local and regional planning, which Chip touched on as well. And Ann Fritzel here at Commerce, she'll be speaking about the new housing requirements in her upcoming presentation. So we'll dive a little deeper into that topic. Um, and a reminder too, we'll be offering deeper dive workshops later this year and in the, the next years as well. Um, two of the main topics of course will be housing legislation. Um, we'll get a full workshop on that topic, um, tribal participation and other topics as well, such as uh, critical areas. And the link there in the bottom left uh, will take you to all of these new GMA bills. Um, I do recommend checking them out um, since they're not all codified yet. 
Um, so if you do want to look at which sections of RCWs will be updated, amended, or added um, with new sections, um, I do recommend clicking that link and checking them out. And now I want to give you just a quick overview of our new climate program here at Commerce. Um, as we all know, climate change threatens everyone's well-being and all of our communities uh, worldwide. Um, but starting here in Washington State in 2020, um, the state updated the greenhouse gas emission limits to be consistent with the most recent assessment of climate change. Um, the science behind that and tasked commerce to initiate a multi-year project that develops guidance for counties and cities to address climate change issues within their comp plans. And you can see on the slide here, the emphasis for that will be on mitigation and resilience. Commerce's climate program team, um, I consulted with them on this. They're very eager to help guide local jurisdiction staff through development of a climate plan, um, as well as maybe just an optional element within your comp plan. And please use the link there at the bottom of the slide to explore the resources on the climate program webpage. Um, they are you know, ready to uh, help you out, reach out to them for help in getting started. Um, get more information on their grant opportunities. You can see details there. Um, they are open through July 15th. And as a reminder, um, hopefully most of you already know that the letter of intent for those grants are due by close of business this Friday. And finally, I wanted to just briefly cover our checklists and submitting periodic update packages to Commerce. Um, a checklist for fully planning cities and a checklist for fully planning counties are now available on the periodic update webpage, um, which is linked here on the bottom left of the slide. Um, more resources um, that we have to help you complete your update will be posted to that periodic webpage in the coming weeks. Um, and we're excited to offer uh, uh, resources for partially planning governments as well. Um, so they'll have their own documents to go to. Um, and not get overwhelmed with, um, you know, maybe uh, information that places in King County might need. <laughs> so you can see in the image here on the left-hand side of the slide, um, this is the navigation page um, of the checklist. Um, and as you can see, there's gonna be one checklist for completing updates to both your comp plans and development regulations. And then accept your critical areas ordinance will still have its own checklist as the last round. Um, but we do link to that checklist in this primary checklist. Um, so they'll be um, uh, linked together and easy to access along the way. And this navigation page, um, you'll be able to click on each element um, and work your way around. And you don't have to work on them in order, of course. <laughs> Uh, new legislation since the last update cycle is highlighted in yellow throughout the checklist, um, and we hope this help uh, helps act as a as a cheat sheet for you to find out what's new since the last cycle. And when it's time to submit your drafts for the 60 day review and final review, um, we encourage you to submit through our plan view system. There's a screenshot here on the right of where you can go. Um, and that can be accessed through that link on the top right, um, directly under Commerce's Plan View system text right there. Um, we do recommend setting up an account so that you can track your submittal, um, but we uh, don't require that. So users um, can enter as a guest as well, um, but for tracking and monitoring, we do recommend you sign up through that account. We do still allow email submittals as well um, through that email address that's linked on the middle of the slide there as well. Um, but we no longer accept paper copies. So um, just a reminder out there for everyone. Um, and soon after this workshop is over, your regional commerce planner will be reaching out to help you get started with Plan View, answer any questions. And they're going to be there to help you through your entire process as well. Um, and many of you probably know who your commerce planner is. Um, but uh, do be ready for them to, to reach out and help you along the way. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dave Anderson. He's our managing director here and he has information on grant opportunities. Thanks Suzanne and thanks to all of you who attended. I'm delighted to see so many folks here. Um, I've, I've noticed there's in addition to uh, 
the folks from Central Puget Sound, there's folks from Chelan County, Skagit County, Whatcom, Spokane, Clark, Thurston, and Lewis County. So I'm glad to see uh, folks from elsewhere in the state are starting to think about this. Um, when we were originally doing our planning for the update operation, we were sort of thinking the starting gun goes off two years before your update, but we're hearing from a lot of folks that they need that they're starting early and I, I think that's I think that's wise and uh, if you're not if you're from somewhere other than the Puget Sound I'm really glad to see you here I think you're on the right track starting early so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the grant process so this year for the first time almost since the GMA was passed the legislature has committed to a significant investment in the planning process as part of the update. So looking here, you're seeing this slide shows you uh, the, the grants that are gonna be available to you depending on whether you're fully or partially planning and depending on the size of your jurisdiction. So these grants will be available for you, to you. If you're, if you're in the central Puget Sound, uh, you'll be receiving an award letter from us in the next couple of weeks that will indicate the amount uh, the amount that you're going to be eligible for and tells you a little bit about the application process. You will be able to start spending a grant against this grant on July 1st. So it's a formula grant. So know you know we're good for it. If if you don't if we don't have the contract and we don't have the scope of work all worked out, you don't have to wait for date of execution. You can start you can start charging against it and we'll reimburse you for any expense that occurs after July 1st. We'll be sending out that notification letter. Soon after that, you'll get a call from your regional planner who will talk you through it. Um, there's, an, there's uh, it's kind of an application, but it's formula grant. So uh, it's, yeah, you're, you know, you're entitled to it. What we're gonna be asking is just who your contact information is. And um, we're gonna ask you to do a scope of work and uh, a budget for the update. You'll get the contract will be for half the amount shown here on the slide. You'll get half of it the year before your update and you'll get the second half of it the year of your update. So, uh, and we're talking fiscal years here. So July 1, 2022 to through June 30, 2023, that's year one, June 30, 2023 through June 30, 2024. That's year two. So if you're a city under 3,000, you'll get 50 grand one year, 50 grand the next year. So you can start planning for that. And if you're a jurisdiction uh, whose update is further out than that, plan for that to uh, plan for that to be coming in consistent with these amounts. Uh, 20, uh, one year and two year before your two years before your update. One of the things you we're we're asking for is the first deliverable on your update grant is going to be completion of the checklists. We're doing that because one of the things we've discovered going through these update cycles is that jurisdictions that complete the checklists and develop a scope of work for their update process are much more likely to complete the update uh, in a smooth and timely manner. So that is really a clear distinguishing factor between those that are successful and those that tend to fall behind. So we're asking for that as the first deliverable. Um, we've got the updated checklists. So uh, we're looking forward to, to talking to you about that. Next slide. Oh, I guess we're already on to state housing needs. Um, so remember too, when you're talking about your grants, there's for the Central Puget Sound jurisdictions, there's your update grant, which covers anything update related. There's the additional optional grant for jurisdictions that are choosing to get started on climate action. And there's also going to be grants available for jurisdictions who want to uh, implement policies to expand housing choice. And I think Anne's gonna talk a little bit more about that process as she talks about uh, implementing House Bill 1221. So again, thank you for, uh, Thank you for attending, and we're looking forward to working with you on this. Dan? Thanks, Dave. And thank you, Suzanne. Yes, we're going to take a little bit of time to dive into the housing changes to the Growth Management Act because they are pretty significant this time. And we do have additional funding, as, as Dave mentioned. So one of the biggest changes was House Bill 1220, which passed last year. It significantly changed the housing element requirements to require much more intentional planning, really to address the housing crisis, which has been going on for at least five years, with housing prices out of reach for many 
increased levels of homelessness confounded by a pandemic, which emphasized the safety and need to be not in a congregate setting, but in one's own home. So every local government fully planning under the Growth Management Act must plan for housing needs by income band and for special housing needs as provided by the Department of Commerce, which is new, and examine past racial discrimination and exclusion in housing and adopt policies to begin to undo this harm and prevent future displacement. And that's also new for us as a state and really unique in the US. Other Western states, Oregon and California, are projecting housing needs. But this racial segment is, is new for a state in general. And we know this is complicated and it's not politically easy. And we know that staff and consultant capacity is difficult. And so we are working hard to divide, provide as much technical assistance as we can. So let's take a detailed look at these changes. First of all, the 1220 significantly strengthened the housing goal. It was a softer, encourage affordable housing. And now the language is plan for and accommodate housing affordable to all economic segments. The requirements for the housing element were also updated to put more focus on moderate density housing options in urban growth areas, to require communities to document barriers to achieving housing needs, and to consider the proximity of housing in relation to employment. One of the first times we've seen more spatial requirements to the Growth Management Act beyond the compact urban growth and the role of accessory dwelling units in meeting local housing needs. The bill requires commerce to provide projections of housing need for lower income segments and for special housing needs. We expected that counties and cities would work together to allocate these projections in the same way they do for population but we received a lot of requests to provide more detail at the city level. And in the Puget Sound region, we're working within the context of the regional growth strategy as well. Next slide, please. So on the right are the income segments. So we'll be projecting future housing needs by income band. These include emergency housing, shelters, and permanent supportive housing, which are generally part of those lowest income bands. To develop projections for those special housing needs, we have focus groups around the state to get input on who is captured and who is not captured in our existing data, such as the point in time count and data collected at schools, and what is driving homelessness to get realistic projections of those needs, which are significant. We've also been working hard to build a housing needs projection model that considers ways to plan to reduce cost burden in lower income segments. Those are for people that are paying more than that 30% of their income for housing, which means they really don't have the funds for other things. And plans for workforce housing. How do we, how do communities attract the workforce they need to support their economies when housing is so far out of reach? The model considers equity and regional balance. We've considered a variety of data sources and worked with local developed demographers. We know that many of you are in the process of adopting population targets, and our guidance will include recommendations for allocating the countywide projections to cities and the counties. And these recommendations that we're making at the citywide level can be adjusted to address buildable land capacity, current disparities in the location of affordable housing, jobs, and transit service. We know that some of this is already included in the way the regional growth strategy has been developed in this region. So we recommend alignment with the strategy as a starting place. Another thing to be aware of is that the housing numbers might be higher than you expect because we are considering things like underproduction. We have not been keeping up with our population growth and cost burden. Most of those increased projections will be at lower income bands, which will need to be planned for and accommodated, likely in higher density areas. So you might think about where more middle type housing would be appropriate in your community or if there's strict commercial areas that might be ripe for development for more housing. Next slide, please. 1220 also required communities to address disparate impacts, displacement, and exclusion in housing. So we're writing guidance to help jurisdictions identify the types of zoning that might have had a discriminatory effect to examine the impacts of past redlining or large lot development, where to get data to review that, and we'll provide example policies that we can begin to undo those impacts. 
Another area to look at is where past infrastructure investment decisions may have displaced vulnerable communities, such as making way for a new road or the impact of future gentrification as a new station area raises property values in the area. Some potential policies may be increasing uses and densities in certain areas and considering infrastructure investments with an equity lens. So that, that will certainly play out in the rest of your comprehensive plan. But there are significant resources in this Puget Sound region. The PSRC has done significant work on this and other organizations have looked at the potential for displacement. So there are resources. And if you have not already read The Color of Law, this is a good time to get caught up about what this part of the um, changes are meant to address. Next slide, please. So I know it feels late with the first round of funding coming in just a few weeks. And we're working hard to develop guidance to respond to these changes. And we're working with cities and counties in advisory committees to ensure it's based in reality. The first priority is projecting those housing needs. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the population projections from the state are going to be a bit late. So we're developing the methodology and so that we will have everything ready by the time we slap the new numbers in, in December of this year. We've also uh, front-loaded this disaggregation uh, of those projected needs among cities so that we can agree in principle and incorporate those into policies. At the same time, we're developing guidance for addressing racially disparate impacts. We will be having an open house late this summer for a review of what that looks like and opportunity for comment. And finally, we will have uh, produce and record webinars for planning staff and for local appointed and elected officials to help people get on the same page, understand what the requirements are and what the policy choices are available at the local level. One will be on identifying and addressing racially disparate impacts. One will be on recommendations for countywide housing needs and how to allocate those across the county and the cities. And one will be on reviewing local land use plans as to how to plan for and accommodate those housing needs at the local level. Next slide, please. So what will this all look like at the periodic update? We expect that the comp plan will include your portion of the new housing projections by income band, as well as your local inventory of housing. Many policies will require updating to be consistent with Vision 2050, and you'll probably need new policies to address new requirements. Much of the analysis related to equity, displacement, housing needs, and capacity may be in your housing element, or as CHIP recommends, in an appendix to focus the plan on the policies and the graphics that explain the current situation. As far as development regulations, there's really been a lot of changes in the last few years. The legislature has really been working to try to streamline development and provide new tools to communities to address housing. So you might look at your definitions, you must allow shelters, permanent supportive housing and transitional housing. And we have specific guidance on that that we've worked on with MRSC. The GMA now requires, RAL has rules related to parking, especially around transit. So you might take a look at that. Um, the rules just changed for the number of unrelated people living in a household. There's no change really to manufactured home group homes or people with handicaps they still must be treated the same as single family home. Uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, are still required if you are over 20,000 people, but the new requirements is everybody should consider them. And we have new guidance coming. We are updating our 1994 guidance on accessory dwelling units. We'll have something out near the end of the year. And there's a suite of optional tools that communities can consider now as the, to support housing affordability new funding options, fee waivers. They put tiny homes in 540 for optional affordable housing. And uh, as State Bill 5818 provide appeal protection for local government actions related to creating more housing. Next slide, please. So the, in addition to the periodic funding, we also have middle housing grant funding. And this is just for cities in the Puget Sound region. And hopefully it will help communities get more ready for the update by addressing certain components of the housing element. As you know, a middle housing bill was proposed in the last session 
It did not pass, instead we got this grant funding. It requires cities to consider middle housing on at least 30% of lots. So where might it be appropriate in your community? What kind of policies might be needed or amended to support them? What, where in your regulations might you make you changes? So do the consideration, the engagement and feed this into the update. It does not require adoption because there simply isn't time to complete the grant by June of 2023. Another component that must be included within the middle housing grant is that racial equity component, something that you already are required to do. So this can fund that work and you can focus your periodic update funding on other things. More information on this grant uh, is on our grants page. Applications are due July 5th. Please contact us if you have any questions. We're also encouraging multi-city application because as, again, as Chip said, we live in a region where it all happens together. We impact each other. And so working on policies together and efficient use of scarce consultant resources can be very efficient. Next slide, please. So we understand this is a lot of new requirements and we are still writing our guidance, but it is a huge opportunity to better plan, plan for housing in our region. So our current web guidance that's ready to go is our housing needs assessment and housing action plan guidance. And housing action plans are optional. They're not required as part of the update. The housing element update is, but our guidance has a ton of really great strategies to think about how to encourage more housing and more affordable housing in your community. We have a housing element guidebook, but it has not been updated to address uh, House Bill 1220. Coming this fall, we'll have those webinars, the protections of housing needs, and our updated guidance. So um, as they come out, please check in and review them, provide comments if you can. And so thank you, and our housing team is here to help you with this work. Thanks. Great, thanks, Anne and Suzanne and Dave. Lots of great information <coughs> about the grants and about the housing requirements. Um, I think we've been scanning the Q and A. Laura, are you? Do you have a few uh, questions from the Q and A to pose to the group? We do, and thank you, folks, for putting questions in the Q and A widget. Uh, first question, um, comprehensive plans often look like a today snapshot plus future predictions. Should the plans include any summary of deviations from the uh, prior plan? Yeah, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, I think, I think it would be helpful for you to identify any areas where there's a serious inconsistency between any of the assumptions you made in your last plan and any of the uh, sort of what's happened since then. That's kind of one of the things the Buildable Lands Program is designed to do is it's designed to, to give you an empirical look at whether development patterns are coming in uh, on track. That's probably a good thing to do to help you with the scoping process because it helps you answer the question, okay, here's what we, here's what we assumed in the last plan and then here's here's what's actually happened and that can help you decide whether you think you need a course correction in the plan or not um, either in the assumptions or or in the plan itself to adapt it's also a good time to look at in your past plan what are the things that the past plan had committed you to doing or implementing over the past uh past years including your capital what capital facilities you were tending to build and asking and identifying, are there things that your plan committed you to doing in terms of implementing or constructing that 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 you haven't done for whatever reason? Um, and then, depending on whether it's a requirement or not, asking yourself, well, is this something we still want to do, or uh, is there were there good reasons why we decided not to do it, and do we want to take that out? So those are the kind of things you can do in terms of looking at deviations from your past plan, those things you said you were going to implement that you've, for whatever reason, decided not to, but it's still in the plan. And then uh, are there especially load-bearing assumptions that you were making about either growth and development strategies, 
or uh, funding funding sources and look at whether they've come in uh, the way you expected them to come in. And if not, or what are you gonna do differently? Great, thank you, Dave. Next question, I think we've heard this from a few people, um, hoping to get some more clarification on meeting the planning, uh, the new housing requirements under House Bill 1220 and the relationship with that to um, potential residential or surplus of residential capacity, adopted housing growth targets, the regional growth strategy, and I'd say maybe if PSRC staff want to jump in on that as well, but folks want to chime in. So the specific question is more information on how that capacity um, impact is with more middle housing? Yes, just that if um, to meet House Bill 1220, if residential capacity kind of exceeds or is below perhaps what's in alignment with um, the adopted growth targets or the regional growth strategy. Right, that's a great question and one that we have been discussing as we work through this 1220 work. We certainly know that, um, that it is a goal of the GMA to make the most cost-effective use of existing infrastructure and adding density, such as through accessory dwelling units or duplexes within developed in areas is really a best practice under the Growth Management Act. We also want communities to be consistent with the regional growth strategy, especially when high capacity transit can facilitate transportation and reduce impacts such as climate change and traffic congestion. So I think that's a question that we probably need a little bit more focus, um, maybe in a deeper dive. Great, thank you. I think, I think one of the things we're gonna have to adjust is our assumptions about the relationship between allowed capacity and assumed future capacity, because if you're talking about middle things like accessory dwelling units or um, you know duplexes or things like that, there's, I think if we make the assumption that if we allow this everywhere, every single lot is gonna do that, I think we're making an unrealistic assumption. So there's gonna be some of it, but it's not gonna be everywhere. So assuming that every single lot is gonna be built out at full capacity in a situation where you're allowing significantly more variety in the types of housing that can be constructed across most of your community is gonna require adjustment in the relationship between our final built out assumptions and actual allowed density. Does that make sense? Yes, and it looks like Liz, do you have more to add? Um, just I'll just pop in from the um, perspective on Envision 2050. Um, Vision talks about uh, the importance of substantial consistency between what your plan is, um, what, what's in your comprehensive plan, and what's in the countywide uh, growth targets. But also recognizes that um, capacity um, has uh, differences in terms of timing, location, um, type of capacity, and that capacity likely would and should exceed um, targets to allow the kind of development that. Uh, communities want to expect. So um, that's in our checklist, it's also in Vision 2050, um, and we'd be happy to talk about that a bit more. Great, thank you. So it looks like we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Um, next question. In the Puget Sound region, we are in the midst of more than a hundred billion dollar investment in transit. Can you please discuss how comprehensive plans should zero in on transit-oriented development? Boy, that's a good one. One message I've been saying is that we have this huge investment and it's irresponsible not to consider how land use can leverage those investments by putting people close to those transit so that they can use that as transportation. And it will result in greater densities around transit stations, probably more than middle housing. We have a series of grants that we have out currently for communities to help them plan those sub areas and do streamline SEPA in that in those areas to help development occur. So this is absolutely a priority to from the state to um, to more heavily leverage those investments. Great, thank you. 
Next question, do you have examples of where using graphics over words is recommended um, or other ways to make sure that we're balancing meeting the requirements of the GMA for each element? I, I think the most basic example of using a graphic over words is a map. Um, there's probably no more basic than the version than that, but I think graphics in the comprehensive plan can also be useful for illustrating concepts, especially the kind of concepts that are likely to be carried forward into things like design standards. And they can do a very good job of illustrating design concepts uh, that will help people understand, okay, if we're talking about a senators and uh, like a, a a centers and corridors or an urban village strategy, how does that look different from what maybe this business corridor looks like today? And if we're talking about maybe more housing in areas that are currently largely big box retail, how does that area gonna look and feel differently in the future? What's our vision on that? I've seen a number of comp plans where the, the document contains illustrations demonstrating what the area could look like in the future or the kind of development. Now, these are not, obviously not regulatory, but uh, an indicator of, okay, if we're talking about this density in this area, what does that actually look like if you're on the street, okay? Or if we're talking about in the transportation plan, differences in terms of how we're constructing the streets, how does the profile of those look different? Those are the kind of things you can have in your comp plan that would help the reader, remember the point of an illustration is to help the reader grasp the concepts that you're trying to con convey. And of course, spatial and visual concepts are much more easily conveyed sometimes with, uh, with either diagrams or pictures. Also good for like illustrating if you're doing this, maybe you wanna show an, an existing conditions document, you know, we all, we've all seen a zillion graphs showing trends over time, and that can make that a lot more apparent to people, um, especially if you're truck. Um, so those that's another example of the sort of graphics you're likely to see in a good comp plan. Thank you, Dave. I did wanna note, we're getting quite a few comments um, or questions with specific questions around um, potential comp plan policies and then implementation through zoning development regulations and local revenue um, to meet housing needs. So just as a plug, we will be having some more housing specific um, workshops later this year. So um, we don't get to those questions today, there's more to come. So I think we have time for one more question. Any advice regarding the impact of remote work? For example, job estimates don't, re don't reflect jobs that don't have a fixed location um, or how many other jobs don't have fixed locations. That's a good question. We're still right in the middle of this thing. Um, and it's anybody's guess how this is actually going to play out over the long term. I think, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you anything definitive other than, boy, I'm sure seeing a lot more people working from home than before. But I, I, I don't know if we have like published instructions on what kind of assumptions you should be making. I'd be fascinated if anyone's dealing, if anyone's um, working on this and they found any kind of definitive assumptions. I, I would say though, just as a general rule, one of the things a good plan can do is help you manage uncertainty. So one of the things you can do when you're dealing with, this is not a situation where we're choosing how many people are gonna work from home or not. This is an assumption about how people are going to make choices about what they do in the future. So this is something we sort of have to make an assumption about and then adapt to. So this is a perfect example of a situation where local governments probably need to keep a look on, you know, make an assumption about what it's going to be based on a conversation. And first of all, determine whether that's actually a load bearing assumption or not. Is this going to change the kind of decisions you make about about your comprehensive plan. And if if so, then probably document what your assumption is and keep an eye on it. And by the next update cycle comes around, we'll know if uh, 
if we need to if we need to adjust based on based on those assumptions. Great, thank you. So I think that's all the time we have for question and answer in this portion. Um, just want to note there are some links in the chat, um, and that's the slides from all the presentations today will be shared later. So more information coming your way, and I will hand it back to Paul. Yeah, thanks, Laura, for uh, managing some of the Q&A. Thanks to Dave, Suzanne, and Anne for running through some of those key highlights from GMA and housing requirements. We saw several questions about some of the specifics of the grant funding. Um, as Dave said, your uh, dedicated commerce planner will be reaching out to you, um, talking about those uh, award letters for the, the planning grants. Dave, I, I did want to slip in one more question, and that's just clarification. So the planning grants are for the two-year period that you mentioned, and mm -hmm. then uh, the, the middle housing and the climate grants, are those just for this upcoming fiscal year? Yeah, that's just for this year. Though those were and, and this is based on where the when in what budget was the funding appropriated. So the funding is appropriated in in this fiscal year and it's appropriated year by year by year. That's just the way the state operating budget works. So were the update formulas for the update grant, it's a you're you're going to basically going to get two one year grants the climate funding and the housing funding they're all one one year cycles so you're on you're on a 12 month clock that starts July 1 of 2022 and ends on June 30 of 2023 and somebody i think from probably outside the region asked whether any of that funding would be available in future years and i i think you just really answered the question that would be up to future uh legislative sessions to make that budget allocate yeah. It's subject. It's subject to future appropriation. I will say in our in our grant package that funds the periodic update. In most years, we're going to be providing some kind of competitive grants for comp plan implementation or for other new requirements that come up. And one of the things we'll be needing to do is we've committed to establishing a community of practice that will be helping us to set priorities for those. Uh, for those future competitive grant rounds. Um, that's not the case for 2023, because in 2023, that is the peak of the update year, and we need all of the funding available to cover the periodic update formula. So there won't be competitive grants from that pot in 2023. There, the legislature may, may choose to appropriate other funds um, we may have more housing funding. Um, the legislature may choose to do a number of different things for other, other, uh, other types of grants. They may re-up the housing grants. We'll have the CHIP grants, of course. That's in the capital budget. Um, but in 2024, we'll be, we'll be providing some sort of supplemental competitive funding in addition to the update funding. Uh, we'll be needing to set priorities with the community of practice, which is local planners, as well as stakeholders um, before that. Um, so I can't tell you what that funding pool, what what that what the emphasis areas for that funding is going to be. Um, and of course, if House Bill 1099 passes or some other uh, climate change requirement, that then that would be funded. Right. Great. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate the, the extra detail. Everybody's always interested in the grant funding. Up next, let me look at my notes. We have Maggie Moore and Liz Underwood Boltman from PSRC here to talk about um, the work that we're, we do in our growth management division, um, the support and assistance that we can provide, and some of the background on Vision 2050, the regional growth strategy, and uh, the plan certification process. So, without further ado, um, I well, first, I want to mention. Uh, Maggie's our main point of contact for the, the plan review system. So um, if you go to our website, type in plan review, you can find all sorts of information, including our plan review manual, but you can also reach out to Maggie. Uh, Liz is our foremost expert on all things related to the regional growth strategy, um, growth targets, guidance, all that technical uh, details. So she's a great resource as well. Um, and of course, just like last time, we'll have Q&A running. Uh, submit your questions. We'll try to answer several of them, many of them, um, towards the end of the session. 
and we'll record all the questions so that we can try to get to them either in an FAQ or in an upcoming session. So with that, I think I turn it to Maggie first, right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Paul. I also took our break to grab a cookie because I'm also in the office. So hopefully everyone was able to do something similar. As Paul mentioned, I'm Maggie Moore. I'm joined by Liz Underwood Boltman, and we are planners in PSRC's growth management group. So while the whole agency collaborates on plan review work, I'm the main point of contact for plan review at PSRC, which means that if you have not already received an email from me, you most likely will in the future. Providing updates as well as you, if you email or plan review email, you're most likely going to get a response from myself or Liz there. So hopefully this is helpful to put a face to our names if we haven't already met. There are so many people on this call. I think there are probably some new faces for everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about PSRC's role in plan review and what's new in Vision 2050 guiding this work. We'll also talk about the plan review process and certification. We'll provide some updates on new resources we have available and what we're working on, as well as what's next. So as has been mentioned, today's event is a kickoff for this Passport to 2044 series. We're planning a bunch of future deep dives, so we'll talk a little bit about those. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So continue putting your questions in the Q&A and Laura Benjamin will again manage those and ask them at the end of our presentation. So why are we here today and why does PSRC do this? PSRC is engaged in this work to provide resources to help you be successful in creating local plans that advance our shared regional goals around mobility, climate change, housing affordability, and racial equity. We really want success successful local plans to continue making our local communities great. In 2020, elected leadership from cities and counties across the region adopted Vision 2050, the plan for how we want our region to grow. And through this work, there was a lot of regional focus, both from elected officials as well as through community engagement around increasing housing choices and affordability, providing opportunities for all, significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions and addressing climate change, protecting a network of open space um, through growing in centers and here in transit. So in conversations with local staff, as well as through the survey we did earlier this year, we know that many of these are also local priorities. And Vision 2050 is the updated plan from Vision 2040, adding 10 years to the planning horizon. Vision 2040, and if you weren't around during the last round of plan updates, Vision 2040 was the plan that guided your 2015-2016 comprehensive plans. Uh, and Vision 2050 has some other new updates. So it includes a new chapter on climate change. So this has um, new MPPs as well as actions in it. It also directs regional and local work on housing and equity. And it includes the regional growth strategy, which is used to inform local growth targets. And the regional growth strategy uses regional geographies to group cities in unincorporated areas based on shared characteristics. It accommodates most growth in metropolitan and core cities and allocates more growth to cities with existing and planned high capacity transit to really respond to regional investments as we talked about during the last presentation and Q&A session. And this growth is captured by the goal of accommodating 65% of population growth and 75% of employment growth for re in regional growth centers and high capacity transit station areas. Um, these are huge numbers. As a reminder, our region has 29 regional growth centers. So if you have centers or high capacity transit in your community, this is really something to be thinking about and working on as you develop your plans. In 2018, a new centers framework was adopted which now requires all existing and new centers to have an adopted sub-area plan that is consistent with vision by 2025. And it opens a new window for designating centers in 2024. So if you have an area you are considering designating as a center, this is the time to be thinking about it. If you need a sub-area plan, that should be being done now, as well as if you have updates to your sub-area plan to incorporate elements of vision 2050. And Vision 2050 has also guided planning at the county level. So this is really meant to be a resource on those countywide planning policies and growth targets. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz to talk more about the plan review process and certification. 
Great, thank you, Maggie. Um, I think many of you are here and are, are aware that PSRC has a role when it comes to um, reviewing plans and certifying plans. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about our process and things that we are looking for as part of that update in terms of consistency with vision. Um, so really, the, the guiding document that we're looking at is our plan review manual, which was uh, updated in 2021. Uh, the plan review manual really translates the regional policies in Vision 2050 um, to a number of different planning contexts. So there are checklists included for uh, countywide planning policies, uh, 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 comprehensive plans, regional center plans, and transit plans. So the plan review manual, um, as well as the checklists, were um, developed in collaboration with uh, local planning staff. So um, after the 2015-16 updates, we really took the opportunity to understand what was working well about our process. Um, and what the opportunities were to improve our resources. So really took a lot of that guidance and support to try to make this the most useful um, document that we can. Um, we did a webinar back in 2021, which is just a, a resource that's available on our website that goes into a little bit more detail about submittals and um, kind of some of the nuts and bolts of the process. Um, and we're certainly happy to answer any questions about that people may have about the submittal process as well. Next slide. Um, so as part of the plan review manual, we include these consistency tools, which um, are really checklists that are designed to help, um, as I mentioned, translate vision to a local planning context. Um, we really um, encourage and support um, jurisdictions using the tools throughout the planning process um, through scoping, through policy development, through drafting um, to help ensure um, a successful uh, process at the end um, and consistency uh, with vision 2050. Um, so as part of the resources, we have these little new icons on some of the um, rows to help indicate uh, where there are new or expanded policy areas um, from compared to the last plan update. So really to help try to um, hone and, and support the plan updates. Um, as part of our work on um, plan review and certification, we also have a certain online submittal form. So once it's time and you actually have a draft plan available, um, that's something that uh, we have an online tool to help uh, submit those plans for. Next slide. Um, so I think one of the big questions people ask us is on what we're looking for when it comes to certification of uh, comprehensive plans. Um, our certification process really revolves around um, a number of different standards of review when it comes to transportation, looking particularly at GMA transportation related requirements. So those are things like um, uh, modeling and land use assumptions as part of uh, travel forecasts, um, project lists, um, policies, and uh, technical uh, analysis to help support transportation planning, uh, as well as consistency with our regional transportation plan, um, including the projects that are identified in your jurisdiction, um, as well as the sort of shared land use assumptions that we have around um, transportation planning. Uh, we also look at consistency with Vision 2050, um, and in particular the nexus with uh, transportation related issues in Vision 2050. But so there are a number of different uh, components when it comes to a certification process, but um, this is those are main standard review and focus areas for our review. Next slide. Um, so I think some of the things that we've heard in the past, and just questions that have come up are th where things um, have tripped up jurisdictions in the past. So just um, there are a few kind of technical things, um, some policy related things that we encountered during the 2015-16 updates that um, just wanted to highlight. So um, hopefully we 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 can know, uh, avoid these issues uh, um, again, but. Um, one is um, alignment within your plan. Um, so um, it, and we have obviously a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of staff working on plan elements. So um, sometimes there we've had issues in terms of internal consistency. So transportation plans that are based on a different set of land use assumptions than the rest of the plan. So um, just something to keep an eye out um, in terms of internal consistency. Um, this question also kind of came up uh, earlier around growth targets and external consistency. Um, I think Vision 2050 is a lot clearer about um, supporting um, uh, alignment between uh, policy, uh, between growth assumptions and uh, within your comprehensive plan um, and the countywide uh, growth targets. So I'm certainly happy to answer any questions about that topic. Um, also providing sufficient capacity for plan growth. We've had plans in the past that um, don't have the land use capacity to uh, actually accommodate the growth. So um, just something to keep an eye out for in terms of your own plan updates. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years around developing growth targets. So I think a lot of careful consideration about what actual um, targets are gonna work well for your community. So um, just something to be aware of though, in terms of what we've seen in the past. Uh, we've also seen a couple issues in the past in terms of transportation requirements. So looking at making sure there's a project list included, um, a financing plan, 
uh, bike ped components. So these are some of the things we've encountered in the past, but um, happy to um, hopefully avoid them this time around um, and allow you to focus on other things that are um, important for our plan update. Next slide. Um, so Maggie talked a little bit about Vision 2050 um, and what's changed about Vision 2050. Um, so there are some new and expanded focus areas um, that were a part of our um, part of vision and um, are now actually part of uh, your county by planning policies as well uh, when it comes to housing, climate, and equity. Um, so just some more um, specifics. I mean, I think as Anne talked about, there were a number of changes at the state level in terms of housing elements, but um, looking at um, additional support for um, housing needs assessments as well as um, capacity for middle density housing and vision 2050. Um, around climate um, support for um, achieving emission reduction goals um, and increasing uh, resilience to climate impacts. Um, and along with equity, um, supporting um, additional and innovative public engagement strategies, um, supporting racial equity through um, innovative policies and programs and practices, um, as well as looking at mitigating and addressing displacement. So a number of things that overlap with um, some changes that at, at the state level, uh, we're also working on some additional guidance to help um, support this work, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about in more detail in a minute. Next slide. Um, so when it comes to our plan review process, I mentioned those uh, Vision 2050 consistency tools. Um, we really recommend um, kind of keeping an eye on those throughout the, the planning process, um, including kind of early on as part of your um, visioning and scoping stage, just to understand you know, what's changed and what um, policies and areas you may need to look at as part of this update. Um, we're certainly happy to have uh, conversations one-on-one, -on -one, um, uh, as well as uh, we have on our website um, all the previous certification reports from the last plan updates. So those are a really good resource to understand kind of what we've, we've picked out as part of the uh, previous updates um, that you may want to look at in, in this uh, cycle. Um, on policy and plan development, um, I think this is also really a good opportunity to um, review the checklist and understand some of the resources that we have. So uh, we're, we're, we have a number of existing resources, but we're also working on some new things to help um, provide some support in terms of uh, new policy areas in Vision 2050. Um, in turn, when it comes to sort of actually developing and adopting the plan, um, we uh, recommend uh, submitting a draft to us kind of an, at, a, at a stage where the plan is mostly complete or plan elements are mostly um, complete, but where there's still time if we do identify um, any additional things to, to work on. So the planning commission stage is often um, a good uh, rule of thumb for that, but I'm certainly I'm happy to talk about what would actually work well for your process. Um, all 86 jurisdictions um, have plans due at the same time. So it's one of those things where it's helpful I think, to plan ahead um, and um, give us all a bit of time to uh, make sure we're, um, we can support you in the best way we can. Next slide. Um, I'm just going to hit on a couple FAQs a week I have got so frequently gotten. Um, certainly happy to talk through some questions that you may have at this stage. Uh, we're compiling a more uh, comprehensive document that includes um, the questions that we frequently get, but um, I'll just hit on a couple of the ones that we hear um, at this stage. So um, in terms of our the review of um, how does certification impact um, transportation funding? So um, our certification process, um, allows the jurisdiction to be eligible for PSRC managed transportation funds. So that's really um, one of the kind of benefits of um, uh, completing our process and um, important uh, access to transportation funds. Um, do plans have to be consistent with the CPPs and the MPPs? Um, the answer is yes. Um, this is the only part of the state that requires um, multi-county planning policies. Um, I think the good news is there's a lot of consistency and alignment between the updated countywide planning policies uh, and the multi-county planning policies, but you should be aware that some of the CPPs, uh, depending on the county, um, have some additional topics or um, expectations um, that go beyond what's um, in, included as part of the MPP. So uh, it's worth looking both at the CPPs and MPPs as you develop your work. Um, how does PSRC coordinate with commerce? Um, obviously, we're here today um, and we'll be working on this uh, workshop series together to uh, make sure there's some consistency um, in terms of our review process, if we uh, were so we end up kind of looking at slightly different things, but where there are areas of overlap, we definitely coordinate with commerce just to make sure that we're providing a consistent and similar uh, message to jurisdictions. Um, and we've had questions about consequences for uh, not uh, completing a plan in compliance with PSRC or state requirements. Um, I mentioned the regional transportation funding um, at the state level. If you don't complete your plan update. 
um, there are some um, uh, some expectations related to state grant funding as well. So good to complete your comprehensive plan update. Thank everyone. That's why everyone's here today, but um, just something to be aware of. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about resources that we're working on um, and what is what's next and how we can support your work. So next slide. Um, when it comes to Vision 2050, uh, we have a lot of resources on our website that help boil down um, the, the scope of Vision 2050 into something a little bit more reasonable. So these are hopefully useful for you. Um, some of them may be helpful in terms of your work with planning commissions or electives just to help sort of boil down and summarize um, the regional context. But um, we, I, I mentioned that we're part of a webinar from last year. Uh, we also have a number of different documents that help identify differences between this between Vision 2040 and Vision 2050. So hopefully that that can be helpful for you as well. Next slide. We have a number of resources on our website now, um, and we have a number that are in development to help support the plan updates. So. Uh, in terms of some of the recent guidance that we've published, um, we have a new economic development element guide um, that can help support uh, development of those um, around of policies around the economy. Uh, we have guidance on tribal coordination, which we're also updating to reflect um, one of the uh, more recent uh, bits of state legislation, but uh, important step um, in terms of coordinating with tribal governments. Uh, we also have uh, a new resource called Community Data Profiles. Uh, Maggie will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but really helps to um, provide easier access to some of the regional census data as well as a couple other data resources. So um, those are all things that are currently available. Uh, we have uh, things coming out this summer that we're working to finalize. So um, some guidance around equitable engagement. Um, we've talked a bit about public participation, the importance of that, um, as well as resources on climate um, and a conservation uh, toolkit. Um, coming this fall, we, we are also working on updating some of our housing resources, um, working on um, resources related to racial equity as well, um, as well as some updated guidance on uh, transit-oriented development centers, um, multi-mobile concurrency. So uh, a number of really great resources that um, we are working on finalizing in the next few months. Um, so we've got this page on our site that really tries to um, identify resources from our from our site as well as from other partner agencies um, by topic area. So um, that's a, a great a great spot to to visit. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have previous certification reports available um, if you're interested in the types of comments that we made um, on your plan or on other plans in the in the region. So um, in terms of data, I just wanted to flag that we are also working on updating our land use vision growth projections. So. Um, this is a really um, helpful and important resource for uh, modeling uh, in part of your transportation element. Um, so this will be a um, data product that is consistent with the new growth targets, which um, jurisdictions are still finalizing, um, as well as Vision 2050. So um, we'll include, we'll go out to the year 2050, but we'll also include uh, 2044 um, to help sort of align consistency with um, other plans. Um, so this is really um, the prime, one of the primary uses is to support travel modeling as part of the comprehensive plan update, um, particularly for neighboring jurisdictions, so you can understand what they're planning for as well. So uh, we anticipate that that will be released um, this fall. Um, certainly, if you're doing work earlier and you've got some questions in the meantime, we're happy to field them and check in with some of our data staff. So, um, but that is in development at this time. So I'm going to pass it over to Maggie to talk a little bit more about other resources we have. Great. So we have some existing resources on equity, and as Liz mentioned, we're developing more. So there's new direction on the valuation and mitigation of residential displacement. So PSRC's displacement risk analysis mapping tool helps to visualize where areas of high, medium, and low risk are today. Um, as similarly, our opportunity mapping tool allows you to see the opportunity score by census tract. So these are great tools to be using in that work. Um, they also include information on the indicators that are going into them, which is really helpful in doing that planning work. We have a new data tool, um, our community profiles. This was just released yesterday, so it is very new. It includes a snapshot of information for every city in the region using ACS data. So it includes data on people such as age, race, and ethnicity data on housing, um, including housing values, monthly rental costs, and home ownership rates. 
and it also has employment and transportation metrics. So as you can see in this tool on the left-hand side, you can choose your community or communities nearby. Um, and you can also look at all of those metrics at the top and get information directly from here on ACS data. So that was kind of a bit of an overview on the resources we've recently developed or that we will be developing. Um, as Liz mentioned, our planning resources page has all of those and more. So that's a really great place to start when looking for things coming from PSRC. We are also available to meet one-on-one -on -one to discuss your plan scope and schedule if that's useful. And we're often available to present to councils and planning commissions when needed. Uh, if you email our plan review email, that's the best way to kind of get in contact with us. We can point you in the direction of resources or we can um, meet as well. Uh, and then the best way to stay in the loop is to sign up for our new quarterly newsletter. So this newsletter will in includes updates on resources as they're available, as well as reminders on upcoming events. The next one is coming out in July, so you have time to sign up for it, share it with other staff you work with or consultants so they can really stay in the know of what's happening at PSRC. And then as far as upcoming events go, as I mentioned, today's was a kickoff for our Passport to 2044 series. We're planning deep dive sessions later in the year. We don't have dates for any of these yet. That's why it's important to sign up for the newsletter so you know when those dates are coming out. Um, but we're hope and these are going to coincide with those guidance documents Liz mentioned. So we're hoping to do one on climate later this summer. And then in the fall, we'll, we're planning for a lot of them. So on housing, transportation, economic development, and equity. We're also talking about doing one specifically for elected officials and planning commissions, um, and then one on tribal participation as well. So if you don't see one listed here that you think would be useful for a deep dive session, either from PSRC or Commerce or someone else, uh, let us know, um, and we'll we'll think about planning that and putting it under this Passport to 2044 umbrella. Also want to reiterate, these are all being recorded, so you can come back to them at any time, too, and resources will be put on our website. So I'm going to open it up to Q&A and turn it over to Laura to help with that. Great. All right. Lots of questions coming in. Thank you all. Um, I think the first one, this will be kind of a combo of PSRC and Commerce staff. Can you talk about um, PSRC's expectation of timing for coordination, consistency review, and final certification of the comp plan in terms of both PSRC's work as well as what Commerce presented earlier? Yeah, I'm happy to start on that. So when it comes to um, final certification, we take uh, our board takes final certification action after a comprehensive plan has been adopted. So um, that work will mostly be happening in 2025. Um, and it usually takes um, several months to get through all, all the jurisdictions. Um, and uh, so that's something we'll definitely coordinate with uh, jurisdictional staff once it's actually time to uh, bring a plan to our boards. Um, uh, Commerce and maybe talk a little bit more about submittal to Commerce. Um, I think ideally, um, uh, it would we would have a more than the 60 day notice um, in order if, if to do a sort of a full review of, of the draft, uh, because it really gives us time to take a look as well as um, respond to any comments that we may identify. So um, I think ideally, um, kind of around that sort of stage where you're working with the planning commission on on reviewing elements, but it varies a little bit depending on your, your individual process, but. Um, that's kind of um, the, some of the information on our end. I'll maybe see if uh, Commerce has anything to add about um, submittal to Commerce. And... Yeah, I can I can talk a little bit about the Commerce submittal. We're, we're of course, uh, we understand that the process on your end starts long before 60 day review. So we're gonna be reaching out to you right away. We consider the process starting um, now really. So. Um, we'd like to work with you on an ongoing basis, um, you know, out in addition to the, the work we're doing with you on the grant, just on, you know, if you want to talk to us about your scope, um, if you want to kick ideas around, um, you want us to look at preliminary drafts, we're certainly happy to do that. And that, that applies to the rest of the state family as well. Uh, I know other, other agencies, uh, Fish and Wildlife, Ecology, um, DOT, the partnership, are all uh, also um, interested in working with you 
throughout the process. Um, ideally, most of these things have been largely uh, settled by the time 60 day review comes in. Um, we're happy to work with you, of course, on an ongoing basis. Great, thank you. Next, I'm going to combine these two questions into maybe a two parter. So the first, um, lots of information shared today, lots of resources, lots of links, more that we know is coming. Do you have any suggestions on how to kind of like prioritize what to review or what you see as kind of like the highest impact materials for people to look at if they have limited time? And then as a follow up to that is based on all this information that's coming out, um, should cities feel like this can maybe kind of serve as kind of the technical assistance and expertise um, that will then not need um, consultant support? Uh, it's a good question. So I mean, I would say um, uh, just in terms of kind of like focusing narrowly on kind of like the what needs to be done, I would suggest looking at our checklist and Commerce's checklist about sort of what's new and different from the last update. So um, I think those are obviously areas where your plan likely uh, may may have some some gaps. And so that's a, a good area of focus, I think. Um, and also looking back at comments that were made on previous updates. Um, I would say for us, you know, we're providing um, the deep dives and guidance documents in order to sort of like help expand on things because we know people will continue to have questions as they as they do the work. Um, but uh, really kind of like ultimately sort of boils down to um, items that are kind of like already identified as part of uh, the checklist that we're working on. So, um, I, and I'd also, I mean, I'd say too that, you know, it's an opportunity if there are areas of particular focus um, like housing, where there's been a lot of changes, you might want to uh, look at and focus on um, some of the resources coming out about areas that are particularly new and different. Um, so just, just a thought on that. Yeah, I'd say I'd say your checklists would be probably a good starting point. Um, and we know that the uh, especially for cities, the housing element updates are probably the big ticket item right now for this update. So that would be definitely worth paying attention to. Another thing that I would recommend is talk to your council and talk to your planning commission about what their priorities are. It's not too early. I, I think one of the one of I think a good practice for the update would be once you've been through the checklist and you've sort of identified here's what we think is the scope of work in terms of meeting new state requirements and in terms of uh, sort of the the minimum requirements associated with the update i'd take that to your i take uh i'd schedule a work session with your council and your planning commission where you sort of walk through here are the things that we see that are in play uh is this consistent with your view of the update process and are there any things is there anything that the planning commission or your council sees as a big ticket item that they want you to bring up um this is a good time to talk about that so you can have a conversation with them about priorities and resources and so that you have a clear understanding of what their expectations are and what 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 they want you to work up there may be issues and we saw this a lot in the last in the last update cycle the the minimum state requirements were not the big ticket items in most jurisdictions there were local issues of local importance and that's how it should be uh, local priorities should be the big ticket items. If not, we're probably doing it wrong. Great, thank you. Next question. Um, can staff share a little bit on best practices for ensuring consistency with countywide planning policies or CPPs, the multi-county planning policies or MPPs in Vision 2050, and then uh, state law with GMA and Commerce? Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, we sort of talked a bit about um, some about that, I think, with the last question of trying to sort of focus on kind of like what's new and different as part of this particular plan update. Um, I think in the case of some of the counties, um, the, the you know, track changes version or a summary of the CPPs is available. So um, that might be also a good, just a good place to understand kind of what's changed in terms of the CPPs in this context. Um, I, I think uh, using those those documents to really inform sort of scoping early is uh, really something that we'd recommend. Uh, and uh, just reviewing the kind of the new, the new guidance that's coming out, 
um, will, I think, help you be a bit more successful. So those are some of the things that come to mind. I would say also, if you have questions, um, asking and just reaching out to us uh, would be really helpful just to make sure that uh, we're kind of all on the same page kind of early on. I know in the Puget, in the Puget Sound counties, um, there are regular staff to staff meetings among the jurisdictions in a particular county. And we think that is a really good practice that we think should occur in every county that has a county and at least two cities. You should be meeting staff to staff on a regular basis. I think that would be a good conversation to have within those forums is consistency with countywide planning policies. And do we have a common understanding of what consistency looks like? Something else that I would say about that is when I'm reviewing a comp plan, uh, or I don't get to do that that much anymore, but I actually, first thing I did was I went to the tables and the maps and made sure the math worked. Um, so that's a good place to start when you're talking about consistency is start with internal consistency. Are you using the same set of assumptions and all the different elements of your plan? Does, do the numbers add up? Uh, are the capacity assumptions consistent with your um, your future land use map. Those are the kind of things that you, consistency starts there. Thanks, Dave. Next question, um, what are some of the consequences or ramifications if a city council does not update a plan in compliance with uh, PSRC and or state requirements? Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about the state role with that? I'm happy to talk. Yeah, about yeah, and I think I think there's there's kind of two answers to that question. The first one is is what are the consequences if a jurisdiction just doesn't do anything if they fail to make? And then the second question is what happens if they make they actually complete the update, but there's a disagreement about whether or not it's actually consistent with the new requirements or not. Okay, so the first part, if you do not complete the update on time you're ineligible for certain grant and loan programs at the state level, including the Recreation and Conservation Office, the Centennial Clean Water Fund, which funds a lot of wastewater programs, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, and the big one, the Public Works Trust Fund. So you'll not, you will be ineligible for a lot of, federal, of state infrastructure assistance if you haven't completed the update in a timely manner. And one of, one of the things we found is a lot of jurisdictions, some common, um, some, some common missteps is they really focus on the comp plan, they update the comp plan, they never, they don't get around to updating the development regulations. And the update of the development regulations is also required. That's the first one. The second one is they complete the update, but they never formally notify commerce that the update is complete. And if you look back at their record and the resolutions that they adopted when they were going through the process, they never clearly specified whether it was part of the update or not. So the thing is over, maybe they're at the staff level, they're inclined to think it was over, but they've never actually ever declared the update process complete. The statutory requirement is that legislative action is taken declaring the update complete. That means by ordinance or resolution, somewhere in there you specify these particular items that are done pursuant to the update, your ordinance or resolution needs to specify this is part of the periodic update. And then at some point at the end of the process, you need an ordinance or resolution specifying Whereas we've taken all these actions pursuant to this requirement, this update process is complete. And it's common in jurisdictions that the drafting of those ordinances or resolution is done by either the clerk of the board or the city attorney. They often use a fairly standard boilerplate from past resolutions, but if you're working on your update, your ordinance or resolution needs to say those things. And also we're, we're asking jurisdictions when you've completed the update process, please formally, formally notify that, that that process is updated because one of our responsibilities is we keep a list on our website, the progress report, indicating which jurisdictions are due and whether or not they've completed their update or not. And 
what you what we want to avoid is a situation where a grant or loan application comes in and the public works department is surprised by the fact that there is a outstanding an outstanding planning requirement they 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 haven't been paying attention to so um please uh bear that in mind when you're when you're coming in on final approach to this update process the wording of those ordinances or resolution are really critical to the legal defensibility of the update process okay because that's going to come up um especially if the jurisdiction asserts they're done and uh, a third party believes that that's not the case the way you worded your ordinances or resolution is going to be very critical to any legal question in front of the hearings board about whether that update process was completed or not Thanks, Dave. And I think when it comes to PSRC, um, our certification process allows jurisdictions to be eligible for our regionally managed transportation funds. So, uh, and uh, the whole the whole process is really um, set up to try to make sure that that happens. So, um, we, we definitely want want everyone to be in that position as well. Thank you. All right. Final question for this round of Q and A. How can jurisdictions collaborate on planning issues of mutual interest, like power infrastructures for electric vehicles, as one example? Uh, it's a great question. I, I think um, Dave sort of referenced the countywide forums. Um, we also agree that those are a really great place to um, help talk through and uh, work through kind of questions around uh, plan updates. Um, I mean, I think some many of these things that are of mutual interest are covered um, as part of the multi-county planning policies. Um, it's also covered as part of um, the countywide planning policies. So um, that that's been a good table to sort of um, identify and sort of bring out some of those issues. Um, but I think we also are working on guidance to help support and expand on some of those ideas as well. Great, thank you. So just to wrap this up, a quick note to Commerce staff, we've gotten a couple questions um, asking for an example of a legally defensible ordinance. So if you have a link to that or something that you'd like to throw in the chat to share with yeah. everyone, feel free. If you go to our periodic update page, we've got good examples on that. And some of those good examples, among other things, are the types of ordinances and resolutions jurisdictions have, uh, um, have adopted and the, the findings therein. I'll drop a link in the chat. I just got a link to our period, periodic update page with the good okay. examples linked Great. in the chat there. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for answering that. Thanks, Laura, for uh, going through the questions. Maggie and Liz for uh, providing so much information. I'm sure people that are still with us here, you're maybe feeling a little bit overwhelmed, but hopefully the takeaway is that there are lots of resources to help you along the way, both um, some of these webinars, printed documents, uh, staff in the different agencies. And um, it makes me think back to one of my early days as an intern with the city of Kirkland, and they asked me to research uh, street vendor ordinances. And they said, um, call up the Municipal Research Service Center and find examples of street vendor ordinances. So, so that's what I did. That was my exposure, my first exposure to uh, what I affectionately call Mrs. C. That's how I remember the acronym, uh, MRSC.org. And so here with us, you know, we wouldn't be complete without talking about a whole nother batch of resources. Um, Lisa Poole recently joined uh, Municipal Research Service Center. Um, she comes from the Bellingham area and have some great planning background um, and has already over the last year been doing some really interesting work, including some climate webinars. So we wanted Lisa to talk about uh, many of the, the resources available at MRC, including somebody talked about ordinances. I know that the website is a great place to go and look at some example ordinances, resolutions, adopting comp plans, things like that. But I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, my press. Great. We're all set up here. Um, thanks, Paul. Again, I'm Lisa Poole, and I'm a public policy consultant at the Municipal Research and Services Center, otherwise known as MRSC. 
And for those of you who are unfamiliar with MRSC, we're a nonprofit organization that helps local governments across the state better serve their communities by offering legal and policy guidance. Our website contains pages on hundreds of topics pertinent to local governments, a sample document library, various research tools, and an Ask MRSC service where local government staff and elected officials can get free consultation. We also conduct trainings and publish several newsletters which cover emerging issues affecting our cities and counties. I'll go through some of the comprehensive plan related resources we offer through these services on the next few slides. The focus of our topic pages, otherwise known as our web pages, um, is on compiling useful examples of programs, plans, policies, and codes that are helpful to local governments in their work. We also link to relevant state statutes and guidance from state agencies. Some comp plan related topic pages that we offer include the Growth Management Act, and that page includes information on natural resource lands and critical areas, comprehensive plans, UGAs, and the Growth Management Hearings Board. We have two distinct pages on comp planning itself, one related to required and optional elements, and one focused on the periodic update process. We also dive into more specific issues and plan elements, such as capital facilities planning. We have several pages related to housing, including multiple pages on affordable housing, as well as infill development, accessory dwelling units, and missile, missing middle housing. And as Paul mentioned, um, over the past year since I've been at MRC, uh, I've really been focused on climate change. And we have several climate change pages that we developed as part of our local climate response project that we undertook late last year and earlier this year. And these pages cover climate change topics such as equity and engagement in climate planning, greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies, adaptation and resiliency, funding resources, and we also have an interactive map of local climate plans from the, throughout the state and these include comprehensive plans that address climate action, including mitigation and adaptation. We also have a, a page that's specific to transportation plans, including transportation elements of comprehensive plans, as well as a brand new one. Um, it was just updated today, in fact, on transit-oriented development, and it also includes transit supportive development and um, bus rapid transit. A few other pages that could be helpful in your planning process include those on the Shoreline Management Act, critical areas, sustainable development, economic development, community engagement, and more. Next on to blog posts, which we publish twice a week on our website. Uh, some recent relevant posts by our staff and guest authors include these topics, HB 1220, which Commerce staff touched on earlier in this, web, in this workshop, um, using affordable housing overlay zones as a tool to reduce displacement, manufactured home parks, and this one is really focused on the city of Kent as a case study, uh, we also have a few posts on uh, vehicle miles traveled or VMT reduction. Um, our most recent post is from, uh, it's a guest post from WashDOT, who's working with Commerce on developing a process for establishing local VMT reduction targets and recommending a suite of options and funding for local jurisdictions to achieve these targets. We have other relevant blog posts you might find useful as well, including several on climate change that were part of that project I mentioned, missing middle housing, and planning and housing legis legislation. On our site, you're able to search for various documents and resources through a few different ways, one of which are, is our customized city and county websites search tool 
which lets you search multiple city or county websites simultaneously using our search boxes. We also have city, town, and county profiles, and these include city officials, comprehensive plans, codes, and budgets for all the cities, towns, and counties throughout the state. Through our sample document library, you can search for resources such as comprehensive plans, codes, and ordinances. Regarding trainings and webinars, we have a few coming up that you might be interested in. Um, on June, June 28th at 11, I'll be joined by WashDOT and the cities of Spokane, Stanwood, Redmond, and Olympia to discuss transportation options and BMT and emissions reduction strategies. The summer version of our land use case law update webinar will be held on June July 21st at 11, and both of these include AICP and other types of credits. And I did want to note that we're in the process of pulling together a webinar on missing middle housing for this fall, so check our website and stay tuned for that. We also have a selection of on-demand webinars, which are recordings of past webinars. For example, this past winter, we held a series of three trainings on climate change that were part of our local climate response project. And these specifically were around climate action planning, equity and inclusion in climate planning, and resiliency and adaptation planning. All three of those are available at no cost. Other recordings that may be of interest to you include those on affordable housing, economic development, community engagement, and more. If you're unable to find what you're looking, through, looking for through our site or have a legal finance procurement planning or policy question, feel free to reach out to us through the Ask MRSC button on our homepage by calling us directly at the number on the screen or by emailing any of our legal or policy consultants through our staff directory. I also want to point out a brand new opportunity. Oh, I'm sorry, actually missed that part. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, uh, which is in the process of being refreshed uh, from every other week to weekly through the link on this page. Our newsletters are a great way to stay up to date on our latest blog posts, upcoming trainings, and local government news. Now on to the new opportunity, um, our Climate Action Peer Network, which is a collaboration among MRSC, AWC, and WASOC. This is something we're providing on a quarterly basis as a way for local government staff to learn from one another about local success stories related to climate planning and implementation. Our next meeting will be held later this summer, likely in August. And we're starting a listserv for this group as well. So please let me know if you're interested in joining us. Please feel free to reach out to me with questions or if you'd like more information on any of the resources provided today, happy to help. Thanks for your time. Great, thanks Lisa so much. So many resources at MRC, I, I've always found it really valuable. Um, and we appreciate you Lisa kind of working through a cold, um, <laughs> doing that presentation anyway. We, we won't uh, send you a ton of questions to answer, recognizing that that your voice is a little bit hoarse there. Um, but we have noted that we've had over 50 questions come in today. Really appreciate that from everybody. We're going to wrap up. We want to ask you just a couple of questions before we close to get some feedback from you um, and where we go next. Um, recognize a lot of this was about kind of process and resources. Um, we are looking forward to some of those deeper dives. I'm really excited about this round of comprehensive plan updates. Um, as like I said, many cities have great plans already that meet, you know, 99% of the requirements of GMA. This is really an opportunity to look at what's new, what's different, what's changed. Maybe you have a new light rail station or a BRT route um, in your community, or maybe you've had a new influx of jobs or some new employer. Um, this is a great opportunity to look at those local issues that you have and um, having your plan work for the next 20 years in your community. Uh, those deeper dives will be coming up. You'll hear more about them. We talked about the newsletters from multiple agencies. 
Um, and as we said, please reach out to staff at Commerce, MRC, or PSRC um, for questions. We'll, we're here to try to help you as much as we can. Um, I wanted to end here with just a couple more poll questions. So I'm going to go on and launch this. Would you be interested in a pairing program for virtual coffee? Essentially, what we've recognized in the past is that oftentimes planners have a lot of value in just talking to other planners at nearby cities. Um, those countywide forums are great, but those are usually have just a single representative. Um, and in, in the past, when we've done these workshops, we've had some like kind of coffee breaks so that people could just meet each other. You can do that on Zoom as well. Um, we thought about using breakout rooms, but with such a big attendance that that started to get uh, too big. Um, and so I'm, I know people are still kind of filling that out, but I think the results speak for themselves. So I, I'll go ahead and share them. And so, yeah, a lot of people interested, maybe there's a way of pairing people together. Um, that's uh, in hearing some more kind of learning from each other. It's always a great way of doing it. Here's a, another question. Uh, how are you feeling after this workshop? Did did we make you more confident or more overwhelmed? <laughs> uh, maybe both. Um, and like I said, we had a lot of questions come in, some that are very specific about kind of the, the, the technicalities of the review process or how to be certified, um, how it affects funding, the grant funding. And so hopefully we can provide all that information to you either directly or through some of the materials coming out. Um, give this just another second here. Um, I'll go ahead and share these. So glad to see that many people are feeling more confident. Yay, appreciate that. Um, recognizing many of you still have more questions and uh, and not surprisingly, uh, plan to attend some of those deeper dive sessions coming up. Um, we recognize that many of you are already underway, looking at stuff, doing scoping, and um, you're also processing this incoming information as it goes. Um, sometimes that's that's the nature of planning, uh, but hopefully we can also get that information to you in a timely manner where that's uh, supportive of your process. And let's go to second to last question. Um, this one asks for any other feedback. Um, you can also put these into the Q&A, um, but if you have an immediate thought on uh, feedback here, feel free to jump in with um, some feedback. We, we appreciate hearing it. And um, you can also follow up with us afterwards in any of the three agencies. And if, if there are any deep dives that you'd like us to do that didn't occur to us, if you could let us know. And Dave, you're you're jumping ahead. The, the last oh, question okay. is exactly Sorry. that. So I, I, I'll uh, I'll let you know if you have suggestions for a deep dive. That's going to be our final question, um, and you can do it through the polling, or you can just let us know, you know, directly um, in a, any way that works best for you. Um, and as we're doing that, I want to thank Council Member, or I should say, Deputy Mayor uh, Tracy Buxton from City of Des Moines. Um, she's been a great participant in PSRC regional issues, um, really a strong supporter of planning, as you heard, and really talked about um, why this is important for communities. I want to thank Chip Vincent for giving us some of his wisdom about getting through the process unscathed and in a timely manner and, and how to avoid some of those pitfalls. Really helpful. Um, everybody from Commerce, from PSRC, Lisa from MRC, really appreciate all your presentations. Um, I'm gonna end this poll, share these results so that we can take a, I, I guess we get the results, we don't get to see them. <laughs> I thought maybe it would show the actual uh, uh, feedback, but, but we'll take note of that feedback. And, um, and yes, the last question is, other topic areas that you'd like to see some of these deeper dive sessions on. We mentioned looking at doing housing, climate, economic development, tribal coordination, um, and in transportation. And I think some of the state agencies are looking at some 
uh, critical areas um, potential sessions. So if you have suggestions, please let us know um, in any of these different formats, whether here in the poll um, or just directly. But um, we, we have a, a number of staff working on these things. Hopefully we can get some of that information to you. And as I said, I mean, you're probably thinking, well, it's going to take me the next two years just to read all this stuff. There, I, there's some truth to that. We recognize that. But hopefully it's something that as you get into your scoping, you can identify some of those key issues with your community, you can perhaps focus on that. And then as you um, work on, say, housing policy, you can turn to some of these guidance documents to have um, some support, inspiration, and, and um, uh, guidance about how to write those policies or how to best address them. Um, I will say, I, it, somebody asked a question about climate and resilience. Uh, Vision 2050 has um, some policies that were updated about climate, but also expanded that section to talk more about resilience. So you may want to take a, a look at the policies in Vision 2050 for some ideas as to like what are those policy areas to cover um, on climate and resilience and may look at that might help you think about what's the policy direction that you might want to set at the local level. Um, we just had another person participate. People, a few people are still answering this question, so I'm going to keep it up there um, for another minute or two. And um, I, Maggie mentioned briefly, so you probably caught it, the idea of also doing a session with elected officials and planning commission members. Um, that might be at somewhat at a somewhat higher level, but Commerce and PSRC are both interested in doing something like that. Um, and hopefully we can do it in a way that helps you. So I think when the elected officials better understand the planning requirements, um, things that you need to do for SEPA, for scoping, for public outreach, for meeting um, requirements, both under GMA and Vision 2050, the consequences. Um, we had a question about like, what are the consequences if you don't get it done? Uh, being able to help explain that to elected officials. Um, so we hope to be able to have a session that can be geared towards elected officials to be able to help them understand what needs to happen for these comprehensive plan updates. We've also heard a number of communities, it looks like we've slowed down here, so I'm gonna end this poll and wrap things up, but we've also heard, heard um, communities talk about just working with the public and uh, we recognize that. So as we develop some of our uh, materials, and I think this goes for all three agencies, trying to help communities express um, whether it's housing need or climate needs, um, to be able to express those in ways that can help with that public discussion. Because sometimes we just get confronted with um, kind of a, a NIMBY or why do we have to do this type of uh, response from the public. Um, we are also working on a public opinion poll about housing needs. Uh, both Commerce and PSRC are teaming up on that. So we hope to be able to have some statistical data that might be useful at your local level as well. Um, with that, um, we have recorded this um, so you can come back to it or share it with others. Um, I wanna thank all the staff that helped support this, at all three agencies, and thank you again so much for joining us today and being part of this webinar. Have a great day.